camera does not want to acknowledge that my face exists. <laughs> I'm Abby Esparza with photomanipulation.com and I want to share some of my tried and true tips that you can start to implement up basically immediately. Not specific to Photoshop or any editing program, but general compositing advice. That's the whole gimmick we're going with here. Because while how-tos are great and I do like making them, I rarely actually watch them myself. I like more general, all-encompassing advice. I can't say the word encompassing, by the way. Uh, but because I have a fish brain that gets bored the second it hears a list of numbers and settings, how-tos just don't work for me. So let's jump right in, again, for all you other fish-brained people. I don't mean that in an insulting way. This video is a literal mess. So let's jump into our very first tip, which is if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Uh, sometimes I see a compositor extract and knock out the background of something just to then replace it with that same exact material or setting. And there's just no point in recreating something that already works, and no one is rewarding points just for doing things the hard way. Trust me. Uh, there was no point in swapping out the background here when the original already worked so well. Uh, you still need to extract subjects in these scenarios so you can adjust lighting, shadows, or continue to composite onto that original setting, of course. And it can be a good idea to just separate all of the different environmental elements in general uh, background, midground, subject, and foreground. All on multiple duplicates of that same layer, each with a different element extracted, ideally using masks, of course. And I definitely recommend naming those layers if you have more than two to avoid flipping through identical looking layer thumbs uh, wondering which one is the one you need. And luckily when extracting an image basically onto itself you can be a lot more uh, lax with that extraction. Of course, keeping in mind that if I wanted something completely different, that swap becomes necessary, if our friend here was in a zoo environment, for instance. But in this case, there would have been no point in recreating a misty mountain landscape when we could instead just enhance and build on what we already have, especially because it already looks fantastic. That, of course, wasn't the case with the model, which needed a complete uh, background swap. You also might run into scenarios where only smaller parts of an image match each other. For instance, if she was standing on rocks, then I could incorporate those rocks into uh, her similar but new environment. That scenario is going to pop up more with uh, grass or any other naturally highly detailed surface. It, of course, it's not about limiting what you do, um, extract when you need to extract, but if you don't need to, just don't. And that same philosophy can be applied to looking for stock images that already work with uh, what I call the hero image, which is just the core photo being used, whether you took the photo yourself or you're working alongside a photographer. Or maybe you just found a stock image that really excited you. Uh, that image then becomes the guide for all other companion images. You'll want to try and find photos that already work with that hero image's angles, uh, lighting, and even changeable things like color and contrast. This is less applicable to things like matte painting and landscape landscape composites in general, but for most portraits or character driven pieces, you want to try and uh, pick images that already have some level of cohesiveness, if you can. I know the stock image struggle. <laughs> Number two, uh, choose a set of colors and stick with it. If you have issues with colors and color theory in general, one of the best things you can do is limit your color palette and just choose three colors and focus on those colors. Uh, don't worry about color harmonies, just choose a set of colors that ideally exist within that original hero image. Now obviously with photo compositing and editing in general, you can turn anything any color. Again, it's not about limiting yourself, but if you constantly struggle with color matching and choosing color palettes, it's a great idea to just dumb it down and go back to the basics and again pick a, a very limited color palette. I have three colors here, green, blue, and brown, all of which were already in that panda's environment. I let green be the strongest, more vivid color, with blue being more subdued, although there is lots of it. And the browns act as like a neutral base. When choosing your limited colors, the value and intensity will matter just as much as that hue. But again, don't overcomplicate things. Uh, basically, just pull back on your other colors if you want that strong, deep emerald green, or whatever that hue is. 
This is especially important if you aren't working with active color harmonies. You don't want to use colors in equal amounts. Uh, choose one color to be loud and the others to be more muted in comparison. If you want to have several vivid colors, you'll want to lean on those color harmonies much more. That's why you see a two color uh, complementary color scheme basically everywhere, blue and orange to be specific. It's a hard color combo to mess up. But if you're going to reuse uh, the same color palette over and over, it's going to start to get boring. So absolutely learn the basic rules of color, but in the meantime, pull back on the color scheme, choose one color to shine and the others to support. Fewer colors mean less room for error. And color is so important. I've seen some really nice compositing work absolutely wrecked by poor color choices. And finally, play with lines and asymmetry. A photo compositors love themselves a uh, centered subject. And while there is a time and place, if the symmetry isn't actively adding to the composite, it's going to make it really boring to look at. So again, let's keep it simple. Don't worry about specific compositing rules or guides for now. Just focus on spotting the image's natural flow and then enhancing and complementing it. We have three diagonal lines here of the mountains in the back, of the stone ridge, and the panda is also slightly leaning in that same direction. I want to enhance those lines even further by building out the foreground um, of those rocks here, uh, building them up into that same angled line. I also keep these lines in mind when enhancing and adding things like bamboo and smaller details. And I chose this model's pose specifically because she was leaning in the opposite direction of those existing lines. She breaks the lines in both the way she's leaning and in the direction her clothes are flowing. And I always seek out photo pools with multiple different angles like those found on photomanipulation.com for this exact reason. I initially tried out a version of the pose that leaned into the bear, but it was far less dynamic. And that's why multiple angles are always ideal. I almost always ask for multiple poses from the same set, even when working with uh, photographers. If they have a favorite, I ask for the B team, essentially. Because sometimes even slight variations in poses uh, can make a big difference to the energy of an image. I also made sure the subject's face was on a point of thirds, but that's just where the rule of third grid intersects. By the way, I'm not saying a centered subject is bad. In the end composite, my girl and her panda is indeed a center frame, but there are notable angles and asymmetry to shake things up at least a tiny bit. Uh, give your eye something interesting to look at. In close-up portraits, I try to play with those angles in the face and lean more heavily on the rule of thirds. Also, as a side note, if you ever feel frustrated by things like composition and framing, uh, seek out tutorials aimed at photographers. If it's color that's giving you issues, uh, go ahead and look at digital painting tutorials, ones that focus on color specifically. Uh, Figurative-based photo composites are all really just a marriage of the two. It's literally basically one for one. Even if you don't paint or shoot photos, the concept and theories are all the same. And learning and applying those theories are where you're going to find most of your growth, not necessarily in one-off effects. But obviously, those effects do matter, and luckily, I have tons of them too. Like this one showing how to do a really cool inner glow effect. With that, I'm Abby Esparza with photomanipulation.com. See you next time.